welcome back to another episode of 10 Days of Oscars here on the Cinephiles. I know it hasn't been 10 days in a row, but it's certainly been 10 days, and we never said 10 straight days, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But welcome, everyone, to this brand new episode. I am the outlaw, John Roker, joined as always by my co-host on the Cinephiles, stunning Steve Morris. Steve, how are you? Well, obviously, I'm stunning. I'm glad that after eight years of doing the Cinephiles with you, you finally recognized how stunning I am. I mean, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing very well. I'm, you know what? This What's has that? been a great year of Oscars. I, I yeah, just yeah. really, this, it, it, in a weird way, and particularly in watching these last several films, which took me a while to get to, yeah. but it's kind of restored some of my faith in cinema in a lot of ways because they're so different, they're mm -hmm. so diverse. There's some really, really powerful, interesting filmmaking, yeah. and I'm I'm been really excited to go through these things with you. I agree, Steve. Rewatching a lot of these uh, for these recordings has has made me really excited to uh, envision our discussions on them ten years from now. Because I would argue that just about everything yeah. on this list could qualify for a Cinephiles future a future Cinephiles episode, including the movie we're discussing today. Anatomy of a Fall from director Justin Triet, uh, um, and a film that has a lot of connection to things like Witness for the Prosecution, Anatomy of a Murder, Compulsion, these great courtroom classics that you'll sometimes catch on TCM, um, even something like Presumed Innocent. Like There's a lot of connections to these kinds of films, and it's an interesting film that jumps back and forth in time uh, has a um, a victim here who we don't see until well into the what second hour or going into the second hour of the of the movie, um, and all of it is uh, held together by this phenomenal performance uh, by Sandra Holder, who was also um, uh, a part of Zone of Interest, which is a film we're going to be talking about tomorrow. So, Steve, Anatomy of a Fall. Your thoughts on this film initially before we dive into the specifics? This is a great movie. It's a great yeah. movie with great performances. It's at its own pace. And what it does so sure. brilliantly is it just literally never gives you a place to sit mm. and feel like, oh, I get it. It never gives you that. And yeah. even at moments where you go, oh, that's very persuasive. And then, oh, maybe that's not so persuasive. It really, I think, as an examination of how we perceive truth, yeah. which is because uh, I, I, I would expand it beyond just the ordinary courtroom drama into the realm because i think we live today in a realm where we we're really struggling with our ability to understand what is and is not true yeah and i think this movie is an as an examination of that and and really of the futility in some ways when you have incomplete knowledge of no i can't know the truth you know yeah. There, yeah. there there is no truth that i can know and sort of living in that and sitting in that and then kind of going what do i do with that in in my world how do i process it and i yeah. think this movie sort of provides i won't say an interesting solution to that dilemma but definitely makes you think about the possible choices and the way this ends up yeah i think this is one of these films that's going to grow in people's estimation as the years go on this is one of the ones that people are going to discover or stumble upon uh, because it is mostly in english so it's mm -hmm. it is a french legal drama film but it is mostly in english and we find out why in the movie there, in that interaction between uh, between Sandra and her husband there, uh, the character of Sandra and her husband. But, like, this film can absolutely, will absolutely be rediscovered, I think, by a lot of generations of filmgoers as it goes along. I think it's wonderfully directed by Justine Tree. It's such interesting movement of the camera. Um, you know, uh, confidently placed in one location to see a back and forth in a scene, shot from above, moving around. And then there are some times where it feels like you're watching a documentary of the movie with the way the camera moves to the left and to the right to focus in on a person. And I found that to be so fascinating in her directorial style and the confidence that you're going to keep people's attention for two hours and a half um, in a film that, quote unquote, is kind of talky, uh, I think was, is a, was a fascinating, gutsy decision by Justine Triet. And as you said, it's a film that takes its time and yeah. I think because it delivers such a powerful finale, an emotionally powerful finale um, uh, through the sun, that uh, her directorial style and her confidence in what her and a co-writer Arthur Harari created here uh, is validated. Yes, I, I, I think absolutely. And I think 
the 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 slow pace in particular. You know, it's so funny. We, we talked about this a lot in the past. Is there's certain films where, okay, you got to settle in. Yeah. You know what I mean, you got to go like this movie is going to go at the pace it's going to go, and and. I think you mentioned the camera work. I think this is such a confident film. Mm. I think so knows what it is. I think the performances top to bottom yeah. are incredible, particularly Sandra Huller, of course, who's amazing in this film. Yeah. And, and I really go like, I, again, this is why I'm saying these, th this set of films really restores my faith in cinema in a way, because it's not that I don't like Marvel movies and big, you know, I do like them. But this, but but they they can't do what this kind of movie can do, yeah. and it, it, because you have so much pressure to deliver on action sequences, deliver on lore and characters, and deliver on setting up for the next thing, they don't get to sit in a human space yeah. the way that this movie does. And this movie makes you sit in a place where it's like, oh, it feels like the real life stuff, like it's examining how real life works, not how movies work. Yeah. And some of you may be stumbling upon our conversation and haven't seen the movie. Uh, and if we're going to spoil certain things, so if you have an issue with that, you could probably turn off, go see the movie, come back and hang out with us. And if you don't have a problem with it, let's tell you the story. Basically uh, this is a story of two people, Sandra and Danielle in this and Daniel in this marriage. Um, we start the um, uh, film with Sandra being interviewed by this other female writer. She is a writer, Sandra is, uh, and uh, she has an interest in the female writer who's come to talk to her. And then we hear this uh, music, this musical version of PIMP. What a fucking great choice! To Crazy. Song. Um, and uh, what we find out later, we, then we meet their son uh, Samuel, who is taking their dog out for a walk, and he comes back to find his father dead on the ground outside the snowy uh, house there in Grenoble um, and uh, blood all over the snow calls for her mom. Uh, that's who Sandra Huller is playing. Uh, Sandra, she comes out, uh, calls the police. And so begins the next two hours and 15 minutes of this movie where we are uh, being asked to decide if she did it or didn't do it. And we explore this relationship in depth, including possible um, that uh, Daniel had possible um, ideas, what do you call it, suicidal ideation. So uh, Daniel's uh, Daniel's the son, by the way. It's Sa sorry, Samuel's sorry, Samuel. the, the husband. Yeah. Say so, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, Sandra and Samuel are were the the husband and wife. Uh, Daniel is the son. Sorry about that. Yeah. So we get the idea that Samuel might have wanted to commit suicide in the past. That may be the reason for this. Sandra hires this lawyer, Vincent, who is her apparently knew her before she was married uh, to Samuel and. Uh, they begin this whole process of figuring this out. You have a very hard-edged um, uh, prosecuting attorney who uh, pokes holes in all her stories, questions her son's recollections. You have a judge who is on top of all of this as well, uh, possibly questioning whether the son should even be in the courtroom. And then at the end of the film, it is the son who you think initially is going to maybe turn on his mother and reveal some new footage about his mom or reveal new information about his mom who actually remembers that his father took these pills years ago, possibly trying to commit suicide. His dog had taken the pills or had uh, uh, ate the vomit, had gotten sick around the same time. So he tests this out on a dog, which I do not advise you ever doing, uh, like you're feeding it some aspirin. And that convinces the kid, because the dog has the same reaction, that convinces the kid that his father was trying to commit suicide, possibly in the past, and therefore might have committed suicide here. And it wasn't what they are accusing uh, Sandra of doing, which is hitting him over the head and sending him over the railing. And um, Daniel also reveals that uh, um, Samuel had a conversation with him in the car when they were coming back from the vet with the dog after the dog had got its stomach pumped and what have you, where he essentially told um, uh, Daniel that he would have to accept that people are going to leave his life and that he'll be fine and he'll be able to soldier through it. And Daniel believes that was his dad essentially saying to him, I will probably kill myself one day or die unexpectedly one day you're going to have to deal with it. So a lot to explore here, Steve, but I will say this, and I'll say this right off the bat. I actually think Sandra is innocent. And so I found that to be fascinating because for me watching it a second time, I was even more clear that I think Sandra is innocent. Yet the film does a really great job of making you question who might, if, if it could have been possible that she did it uh, or if it was suicide. What, what did you think about how they took us through all of this and how the um, the the script was 
had laid out its plot lines and laid out its plot points and got us to where it got us to by the end. Well, first of all, I think you did an incredible job of recounting the stuff that happens if, if in fact, any of that happened. Right. Yes. 100%. Because this is because this is the secret of the movie is like Sandra says he was yes. suicidal. Right. Sandra says that she found him with vomit and the, there was aspirin pills in the vomit and she suspects that might that might be an attempted suicide. Right. That might never have happened. Yes. Day, well, there's this points out. Yeah. Well, and there's the scene with the there at a certain point, and this is what's so painful about the movie yeah. is that you have this character Daniel who is incredible. This actor uh, mm -hmm. whose name is Milo Machado Graner. Yeah. This uh, incredible, incredible performance. Yeah. And there's this. First of all, just I just imagine the pain of it's not just that your father has just died unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. It's that suddenly there is suspicion that you're the next most, the other most important person in your life, your mother might have murdered him. Yeah. And so you are potentially a kid with nothing. Yeah. And what that does, and, and the movie takes place over like a year. Yes. It's just the year of going like, is this person who I love more than anybody, the only person I have left in my world mm -hmm. might have murdered my father. And so struggling with that, as you do throughout the entire film, is really difficult. And the thing is, is that he's there's a certain point where in order to protect him from the undue influence of his mother, they appoint a court person essentially yeah. there to protect him from his own mother, not protect him from her hurting him, but just for her messing with his testimony and, and interfering with finding the truth. And there's this one point at which Daniel, in total desperation, goes like, please help me. Like, what, how, what do I think? What do I do? And yeah. she gives advice that's something like, look, if you don't have to ha have any evidence, at a certain point, you just have to choose what to believe in. You know? And it's like, well, that's a really interesting statement. And then the next thing that happens is that Daniel gives aspirin to the dog and then says, tells this whole story about how he found, had the smell of the aspirin and, and related it to maybe that was evidence that the dog had gotten sick because of the vomit of the dad when he tried to commit suicide. And then he later recounts this entire scene in the car where his dad tells him this thing about getting ready for the dog dying, which metaphorically feels like, hey, I could die at some point. Yeah. Every single thing that I just said that Daniel said could be true. Yeah. But it also could be I decided, like this person said, to choose what to believe. And I chose to believe that my mom is not the murderer of my father because my life will be better if my mom is not the murderer of my father. And then he invented everything that we just said and made it up in order to save his mom's life. That is absolutely perfectly possible in the way that the film is structured. And that is amazing. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And, and there is the fact that he was, his eyesight was affected by an accident connected yes. to his father, not picking him up or, or picking him up late and getting into that accident. And, that she blamed him, uh, his father, for that situation. Um, so we see, and and it's such a great job that the film does of laying the ground. And she comes off as an unusual protagonist in all of this because the way she deals with death, the death of her husband, she's a hard woman. And I don't mean that in a no. negative way. I mean that in like, she is built of different stuff, right? Dude, there's a way she processes this. There's a way she goes through with this. When we see her initially, throughout, oh, not initially, but through a majority of the beginning of the film, she is very um, you know, nervous about what's going to happen. She's very clear with Vincent about the position she's in. She's worried about her son. So you immediately connect with her. You care about her. Sandra Huller doing a wonderful job, as you said, and you're involved in this. But then you start to sense that there's more here between her and her lawyer. And then as the, uh, near the end of the movie, after... You know, she's acquitted, and when they're at that dinner, there's a real moment where they might kiss, and you're like, Wow, this is was this all done so she could get out of this unhappy marriage? Did she do this? Did I mean you have questions, but it is but it's really the fight, Steve, that is I think the what do you call the fulcrum point of this movie? Because that's the that's the fight I think where you can see where you fall at the end of that fight. Because I, what I saw was a weak, scared, emasculated man who didn't have the guts to step forward and grab hold of his life and was blaming everybody else. I believe, like, I was on Sandra's side in the argument, but I could also see how she could be a very clear, focused person and that she doesn't know that she's imposing a rules, restrictions, and laws 
on every element of a communication with her and being called out on it for her seems so antithetical because she to her life because she doesn't know or think that she's doing anything wrong because she's living life on her terms. Uh, and I think that is an interesting thing to consider in the fight when you're watching it. What did you think watching the fight and what did you think coming out of the fight? Well, again, it's funny. Something that came up when we talked about Citizen Kane mm. is that the, there is a realization that we see all these things happening. But in yeah. fact, the reporter, he doesn't see any of it. No. there is th Those visuals are what are, are memories created by other people in the way that they describe them. And so we say, oh, I saw how exactly how that happened. Well, what really happened was you heard someone telling you about it. We didn't see that. We saw the fight, but nobody else, that wasn't the fight. Do you know what I mean? We didn't actually, there was no video of the fight. Oh, right. We, just heard, right, we right. heard the fight and then they showed us scenes from the fight. And this is the thing where I go through all of like, well, what is the truth? Right. And, the, and the real thing is, is there is no truth in this movie. Like <laughs> it really doesn't exist. Like, yeah. yes, we hear that fight. And yes, we can absolutely interpret it that she was just doing what she was doing was okay. And he did give her permission to plagiarize this one element of the story. And the reality is, you know, we talked about this for years in the cheap seats is some people write the fucking book yeah. and some people talk about writing the book. And I'm always going to give more credit to the person who actually did the job, which he right. didn't. Right. That being said, this is one fight and we hear only one of them. There could have yeah. been 50 fights before then. There could right. have been no fights this, before them. They could have had t entirely. The only thing we know about his conversations were what Sandra says about their relationship. Mm -hmm. She's the only one who says he's suicidal. No one else has confirmed he's suicidal until Not even the day. therapist. Yeah. The therapist doesn't say he's suicidal. And, and of course, this is true too, is that the way, you know, I, I have split from my wife. We had couples therapy. I had my own therapy. And the way I told the narrative to my therapist versus the way that Karen might have told the narrative to her therapist, they are not going to match up. Right. You know, and our relationship is really solid and we're very honest with each other. You know what I mean? So it, ours might be closer. But in this film, there we have we again, I, we don't know. There yeah. is no truth here. We don't know how all of these things happen exactly. We do know that Sandra is certainly minimizing her affairs, which at first she lied yeah. about. And later she said, and then she said, well, you know, he, he, you know, like there's an implication that after the accident with Daniel, they weren't really yeah. having sex and she wasn't, and she was trying to get that from him, but couldn't get that from him. And therefore it was okay for her to go out and do, you know, it's like, we hear all these things, but we don't get to hear Samuel's side of this thing because yeah. he's dead, you know, and there's just constantly, constantly, a and, and this is why I think I, I, there's just broader meaning for this movie for me, which is that so frequently in our world, particularly in the world of our political stuff, is that we hear small amounts of information and then people from various sides put their narration, their narrative, their logic behind what that meant. This person did this because of this and this and this. This is what they meant. And then someone else says, no, no, this is what they meant. And I'm going more and more going like, there's no truth here. I can't actually yeah. know what was really meant you know well, yeah well i think this that's why this film is so incredibly topical for nowadays because i think and i think you're alluding to this earlier steve this idea of there of an ultimate truth is gone now um for the most part like there are large numbers of people who doubt things that we used to hold as truth as true right the flat earthers are growing in numbers People are 100% um, are committed to conspiracy theories. Now we're seeing people trying to push the UFO or UAP, whatever they're calling it this week, uh, these theories and analogies and saying it's this or that and saying that the government's been hiding aliens. for More people are believing that. We're having congressional hearings about it. So all these things of what is true and what isn't true is uh, completely changing in our world and because of the actions of other people. And so we are in a state now where the only truth we can we can actually hold on to is our own truth and everything else we can try to explore and be as um, open to receiving the actual truth. But it goes back to that old adage, there's their truth, my truth, and somewhere in the middle is the actual truth. And this film seems to be a film that proves that because you could look at it from the prosecuting attorney side and be like, oh, he's being belligerent. He's coming after because she's a woman. He's trying to enforce. He doesn't understand that this guy was kind of uh, a, a gutless guy who couldn't actually take hold of his life. But 
it could be true what the prosecuting attorney is saying. Oh, yeah. Is that she was her affairs, her her what he calls plundering, or what he called plundering, and then the prosecuting attorney uh repeats that plundering his idea and making her fame. So her fame is off of other people's stuff and using her own life, using other people's story in her life to make to make herself famous and write these books. So there's a way to see her as a person who completely uses people uh and says for well, even the way she talks about. Daniel, when they're having the fight, like, oh, we can, you know, he he can give, he can be with what's her face for three days. Like, it's no big deal to pawn her son off to another woman for three days. So there's a way to look at it where if you wanted to look at it through a certain prism, that she actually could have killed him and that she was just sick of being with a guy who was like this and she was done. And because she was so, she's a person of such clear vision and clear understanding of who she is and what she wants and where she's going. You could believe that she'd be single-minded in this moment and legitimize it to herself and then go through this whole process to come out the other side. You know, a lot of people feel that way uh, about OJ, that OJ made a decision, feels he was right in the decision, played innocent about it all through all these reasons out there and walked away without any punishment from the situation. Well, he did get a civil one, but not a criminal one. So it's fascinating, the story. I mean, as a person who has, it, it, you know, if you saw me and you have seen me in some in yep. emotional situations, sure, I'm pretty calm, you know, yep. and some will interpret that as cold, you know, right. And if you, you know what I mean? And so it's like, oh. I totally relate to, oh, this person isn't having the expected emotional reaction. Therefore, this must mean this. Yeah. Right. Therefore, this must mean this. Which is the issue, and that's fine. I'll, I, I know I've shared this with you off the mic. I don't remember if we've talked about it, uh, you know, in the cinephiles or anything. But like, there was a time during the Obama administration and into Trump where I just went, you know what? I'm going to fact check everything I see on social media and try to nicely write to someone, hey, by the way, that's not what that actually meant. And my expectation, and part of it was in reacting, it was during the Tea Party era. Oh and yeah. Part of it was reacting to some of that stuff, and my expectation was that the accuracy among the people that I side with, which is the more liberal side, would be higher and that their reaction to be corrected would be more positive. And the answer was that, yes, there was more inaccuracy looking at the the the, the right than at the left, in my experience, but there was plenty of inaccuracy in the left. And basically, left and right, everybody responded to me in the same way, which is they didn't say, oh, thanks, or oh, that's interesting, or oh, I sh I'll take that thing down. They said, well, they really meant that. You know, I would say, you know what, Obama didn't actually say that. This is the entire quote. This is the context of it. And they would say, well, he really meant that anyway. And they would leave the thing up because that reflect reflected their worldview. And I thought what I did it with someone who shared my worldview and said, well, you know what, that that's not what Trump said. This is the whole quote. It's the exact same thing. They would go, fuck you. He really meant it. He's evil. I'm leaving it up. And it was just like, oh, people don't actually want to. They have a gut, and this is what this whole movie is to me. Yeah. You have a gut reaction to the thing you see, and that gut reaction is based on your worldview, how you see the world, what, and, and you just go, well, therefore, that must be the truth. And the gut is not the way to find the truth. And that's why I keep going back in this movie. They're literally, in the whole movie, I don't think there's any solid evidence of anything. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of information. Even you go, the, you, the two pieces of physical ed evidence, which is the blood splatters, yeah. we have two explanations for them, right. both of whom say they are the only explanation. And then from everything else, whether it's the therapist or the plagiarism or the or Daniel's testimony or Sanders' testimony, it's like, well, that's an explanation. And right. here's another perfectly possible explanation. And then we go, oh, I know she's totally guilty or I know she's totally innocent. And I'm like, I don't know what yeah. I do know. And this is the difference. For, and, I'll, and then I'll shut up. But the difference between finding truth and deciding a case is I absolutely think the case is decided correctly in this trial. Yes. Because there isn't evidence to say that she absolutely that we could say. And I looked it up, by the way. So American, the standard is beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's if you're trying a criminal case, that's what it is. In France, it is. Uh, the it is sufficient evidence, which is yeah. a lower standard to find guilt. But I believe they did not get sufficient evidence to prove that she was guilty. So finding her innocent was the right decision in the case. But that doesn't mean she's innocent. You know, <laughs> she, she totally could be guilty. But yeah. they decided it correctly, in my opinion. And I think the smart thing uh, so that you could have that possibility in your mind was to not show the fight, the physical part of the fight. Right. Yeah. The, the verbal part of the fight, 
um, we got to see, right? And that's through the director's point of view. But the physical fight, we hear that through the audio. We hear the escalation of the physical fight yeah. through the audio. And we only have Sandra's word to tell right. us what actually happened in the fight. She says she only slapped him once, and that was what initiated the physical contact, but that it was him hitting himself in the head, which, by the way, is possible. I have certainly, in, in moments of anger and passion, uh, slapped my head or whatever in frustration because I don't want to hit anything around me in terms of walls or whatever. Uh, but he did that, and we see the evidence of him hitting the walls. We don't know that that's actually his fist. Nope. That it could have been her. It could have been someone uh, slamming a piece of wood while he was doing construction. It could have been anything. The broken yep. finger, we think that's from the punch on the wall. And certainly, that's maybe there's evidence of that, but we don't know. We don't get to look at the medical records, just the x-ray. And so there's a lot here that I think I agree with you, Steve. As, as I'm talking with you now, I'm like, well, I thought she was innocent. But now I'm like, I can see how people, because I really left the film going like, I don't understand how anybody could see she's guilty. And then now as I talk with you, I go, of course, because I just bought into her point of view. She seemed believable to me, whereas another person might see Sandra Huller in this performance. He'd be like, no way. She totally did it. She doesn't believe yeah. seem believable in the way she's explaining certain things. And you're right. Like she even lied about the bruises on her arm initially. And she claims because she didn't want to be seen as a suspect. That's yep. a great innocent way around that when she knows she didn't want the bruises to be tied to a fight because she knew she'd be a suspect and she knew she might be guilty, but it came out anyway. So it was yep. foolish with a lot of what she, but I think the lawyer is really the linchpin of all of this, Steve, because he's the one. And as you said, just a couple of minutes ago, he's the one that when she tries to be like, you know, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. He's like, it, none of that matters. What matters yeah. is how people see you and the perception of the facts and the perception of all this kind of stuff. And she's a writer. So as the right. prosecuting attorney points out, like, you could have fabricated all of this and create a great, you can clearly write a great novel based on real life events in your life. You could be fabricating this whole story from scratch in order to get yourself out of this uh, conviction. So it is a fascinating film that challenges you. And I think it holds up to multiple rewatches where you can right. see one way or the other, right? Two, two, two quick things. One is uh, Swan Arlad, who plays the lawyer. God, mm. he's great. Mm -hmm. Has great face. And, and this is all, so many of these characters, they just feel like real people. Yes. You know what I mean? That feels very, very real. Not like a movie lawyer, like a real lawyer. The, I go to the moment that you mentioned, which I had the same thought of, is she about to kiss him? Yes. Is there an attraction here? Because that's what movies train us to do. Yeah. And yet, then I also go, are there plenty of times in my life where someone has reached out and held someone's face like that and it wasn't romantic at all? You know, it's just old friends. Yeah. Like, I, I can, I don't know that this has happened with you and Sarah Cowperthwaite, but it's certainly possible. Do you know what I mean? Like, there sure. could be a moment like that where someone from the outside who doesn't know the relationship would go, yeah. oh, something's going on there. But I mean, in the reality, yeah. Nothing. If anyone um, saw us at some of your birthday parties, I'm sure they'd oh, question yeah. our connections with each other. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Well, and this is, is the, it goes all into context and there's the moment yeah. where they read scenes from her book to yeah. go like, ah, oh. and it's like, as a writer, it's like, I've written all sorts of shit, all sorts of shit, including people wanting to kill each other, including people having affairs, including all that stuff. It's like, and so someone could pull that out and say, therefore that proves that it doesn't prove anything, yeah. you know? And this is, and I, I go back to, and again, I go to like people putting their spin and this particularly comes from as an editor is that as an editor, I can put two shots together and you will think that there's a thing going on. That's not going on. Right. And the, the one that I'm always reminded of is you remember where there was the kid who kind of gave the, uh, you know, the stare to the native american on the hollywood, oh, yes. on, the hollywood on the mall in the yeah. washington mall and we everyone looked at that still photograph and went oh that's obviously a horrible person he's obviously and then as you heard more about the story it was like oh this isn't actually as simple as possible now that right. kid became a huge maga supporter and that became his claim to fame but the reality is is you can't look at a photograph and actually know what was going on yeah. but we think that we can and we cannot, you cannot look at someone's facial expression and just go, I know what their thoughts are. That yeah. doesn't, that's not how humans work. Yeah. Also humans have a really hard time sitting in the unknown. So they yeah. must choose that side. They must choose a point of view. They must choose to believe certain things in order to function in their own construct. And whenever their societal construct is upended, then they desperately seek to find any point of view that feels comfortable to them in order to reconstruct it as quickly as possible. Um, yep. which is a fascinating thing you know, to explore. Um, all right, we're, dude, we're almost at 30 minutes. We should wrap it up here. Uh, all right, but there you go. That's our conversation here 
on uh, on Enemy of a Fall. Uh, obviously, clearly, there's a lot more Steve and I could have dived into, but we certainly wanted to give credit to Justine Triet for directing a wonderful film and co-writing a wonderful film here, and fantastic performances from this phenomenal cast, uh, in, uh, you know, leading with Sandra Holler uh, on down, and uh, a film that I think, as I said, is going to be uh, holding up to multiple rewatches going forward in the future. And thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation. Steve, what do we have to tell our fine listeners and uh, viewers? Well, first of all, they should like and subscribe this video because why wouldn't yes. you do that? And then and then you also might realize that if you're not as much into the YouTube thing and you don't like looking at us, which I can't imagine why, because <laughs> you're so striking. As you said, I think you called me stunning when we started this video. Is uh, But you can actually just listen to our beautiful voices on our podcast feed. You do a search for the cinephiles where in addition to these kind of reviews, we do very, very, very deep dives into the greatest film of all time. We're in the middle of our season of Scorsese. We just yeah. finished three parts on Raging Bull. We're about to have not Scorsese, a little uh, palate cleanser with a live show on the classic 1986 comedy with Rodney Dangerfield, Back to School. And then we jump back into Scorsese with The Last Temptation of Christ. That's all on The Cinephiles. You can support the show at patreon.com slash The Cinephiles, as well as through Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe, get ad-free versions of the show, listen to our Cinephiles shorts, and on Patreon, a whole bunch of other stuff you can do as well. And you could buy or stream all the movies we reviewed at cinephiles.net. And I am SR Morris on Twitter and SR Morris one on Instagram. Yeah, and I'm at the Roca says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us. Look for our conversation tomorrow on Zone of Interest. And we'll be right and we'll uh, see you next time on another brand new episode of the 10 Days of Oscars here on the Cinephiles. Take care until then.